and welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres. Uh, if, this, if you're looking to improve your understanding of photography in various different ways, then you're in the right place. If you're, we're, if you're watching this live here, leave a comment. Let me know you're here. Let me know where you're from. Let me know what the weather's like. Let's get the chat going. I've uh, got four different images sent in today for critique and feedback. Um, and one of those in particular gets a little bit philosophical, almost on what is the nature of photography, well, certainly as we're dealing with it. So plenty to think about and um, yeah, join me in a sec. So yes, hello and welcome. Um, so today, like I say, we're going to be doing a bit of feedback and critique. Now, next week is the third anniversary of these podcasts. Yes, can you believe it? I've been doing this for three years. Lockdown started. I'm sure a lot of you have been getting your Facebook memories and there's been bits and pieces going on in news about how it's now three years since the original pandemic lockdown. And that's, of course, what kick-started these podcasts. So I kind of got an idea of what I might be doing for that. So stick around. I'll talk about that at the end. So I can see we've got a few people in already. Pat has joined us uh, from a cold, high all from a cold but dry minehead. Uh, Maggie says, good afternoon from an on and off sunnyish southwest Scotland. This is true. Maggie's my wife and she's just in the kitchen next door. And uh, as I look out the window, yeah, the sun kind of seems to keep coming and going a little bit, but it is quite cold still. April says, hello, everyone from a sunny and windy Long Island, New York. Rosemary says, good morning from Washington State. Cold and drizzly here. Um, and from uh, Texas says good morning from Texas mild and sunny here Fiji says good evening everyone Fiji in India and Meg says hello everyone excellent so we have people in we have um, pictures to look at we've got lots to get on with right okay so oh Fiji says it's clear beautiful breezy night here in India oh how well that sounds rather lovely <laughs> And it will be warm. It will be warm. Even if it's cold for you, VG, it will still be warm. Um, VG and I have had a few discussions before now that when it gets down to sort of about 24 degrees Celsius in India, everybody's going around with extra jackets and shirts on and complaining how cold it is. Whereas 24 degrees here is the height of Scottish summer. Um, however, we're nowhere near the height of Scottish summer yet. It's still, it might be April now, but it's only about, I don't know, eight or nine degrees might possibly get up to ten but I'm not sure the damp cold makes it feel colder that's for sure right okay so where are we let's so what are we going to talk about today we're going to let me just clear those well what we're going to do is I think we're going to let's let's start with VG actually so um, VG sent in an image uh, let me just find this and VG sent through this photo and said I shot a colleague of mine standing next to a photograph of the fort we visited in Goa. Composition wise does this photo look abruptly cut? Something made me stop and capture him uh, capture as he was walking by. I stopped in and asked to pose for me. Let me know your feedback with regards to composition, leading lines uh, and the photo is not edited. I've mailed you the high resolution one. Yeah, this is the high resolution one. He insisted on wearing his shades and posing. <laughs> so, yeah, there's always a slight difficulty when you, you've, you've got a friend walking past and you go, oh, hold it there. You've just seen something really interesting. And they turn around and say, oh, right, OK, um, let me stick my shades on. Let me get my pose right. But having said that, I think that's fine. I, I quite like his pose, to be honest. I think there's, there's, a, there's a kind of friendly intimacy um, a sort of sense of a warm, a warm connection between the two of you there. Um, composition wise, well, it's a tricky one. I think the the first one is. I tell you what, let's just open this in Photoshop and talk a little bit because there's there's kind of two key thing, two key things which I feel um, we are here. First of all. Um, there is a very slight, there's a slight tilt to it, and there's a definite need to just want to kind of ah, straighten that a little bit. And what we're doing here is we're straightening to we're using the vertical line of this part of the 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 fo the, the frame to print behind in order to to work out what the vertical where it is. When it's sort of like this, it just feels slightly tilted. You can see how much more tilted it gets if we go too far this way. So as I kind of tilt this, I kind of straighten this vertical line because that's the strongest vertical line in the picture. There isn't a, a flat horizontal. So that's the place to do it. Now, we've also got a slight problem that it's already quite closely cropped in. So maybe if I do content aware, 
and that will just sort of fill in the gaps a little bit. Um, however, it does feel quite tightly cropped. I guess probably if we were wanting to have this picture in, you might want to have it have a little bit more there. If you basically just stood back a fraction further, um, uh, and then that would have been maybe given you a little bit more options to crop in if you want. If you're not sure, I think I've talked about this before, um, take the photo from just slightly bigger than you think you need and then that will always give you straightening and cropping options whereas if you get it absolutely in camera unless you know exactly what you're doing you're perfectly happy with what you've got in camera um, if you're slightly uncertain step back a little bit you can always crop in a bit more but it's always more difficult to add stuff on afterwards however good photoshop's content aware may be it's not perfect and it's not really what you know better to crop in if you can now, having said that, let's take a look at the rest of the composition of this. A couple of things that happen. The first, and I think I don't really know what the way around this is, it's kind of too late, is this picture in the background is just horribly out of focus. And when you look at a photo like this, what you've got is you've got your friend standing next to the photo. Your friend is one half of the photo. This print, print, is the second part of the photo and as I've talked before the notion with photography is um, every element is either contributing to or detracting from the narrative you're trying to tell and in this case that narrative is kind of getting obscured by the fact that we look at him and we go all right yep nice friendly smiley guy with a hat and shades looking cool move over to the second part of the photograph and it's out of focus so it's taking up um, over half our available kind of real estate picture and it's out of focus. So our eyes come back to him, but it's kind of not really. Uh, so ultimately, I think you, what you needed was you needed a deeper depth of field. You needed a, a narrower aperture um, to start with. And so that if you're going to take a photo of him next to the print, the print itself needs to be in, in focus. The alternative is that you have him standing further forward if there's the room for you to be standing further back and blurring it even more so it's more about him and there's a hint of a picture in the background but it's really about him and then just this sort of sense that he might be in a gallery. But because this is kind of full on um, it's a bit more problematic. As such I kind of I'm more tempted to say if you were going to do this kind of make it into a straightforward portrait you know let's take this and crop it in a little bit and something like that and then maybe because he's leaving his point you have slightly more room in front of his direction than behind and you do something like this now we then need to kind of clean this up a little bit um in fact perhaps maybe that would come in a little bit more that would come in a little bit more something like that you know, to make perhaps a slightly better crop. We've still then got this, which I don't know whether that's now detracting. Now we don't know what this actually is. The problem is, is that if I pull this in too far, we end up with him pushed up against the edge of the thing. So it kind of becomes that maybe you can go to there and then maybe what you have to do is essentially um, remove that part of it, something like that. Now, once now, what we're kind of we're kind again. There's maybe wanting just a fraction more above his head. Maybe we don't need a bit of arm, something like that. It's maybe a slightly better balance. And then, if we were to drop that into camera raw, what we might do is bring the shadows up a little bit so we can get a little bit more because he's sort of lose, losing his face a little bit there. Might even give it a slight vignette there just to kind of pull those corners in. Uh, make sure that we're there and you could possibly if you wanted a little touch of clarity or texture something like that and now we've gone from that to that and at that point I think it's probably quite a nice portrait of your friend your work colleague um, there's a little red hanky hanging out the bottom of the which is also maybe grabbing the attention either remove it or maybe even um, you sort of do the hue saturation and uh, if you were sort of to desaturate we'll just take the mask there fill that back in and then just paint a little bit there that then kind of and kind of then kind of desaturate that a little bit more it stops it kind of grabbing the attention but at that point what we've got is we've got a portrait of your your, your friend your co your work colleague how does that compare to the original here 
we have lost the story you were trying to capture. Your story was trying to be about your friend with the picture. It's just that because the picture itself is so out of focus, I think it becomes a dis too much of a distraction. I think the, the photo as it is doesn't work in the way that you want it to. So the question is, do you abandon it or do you rescue it? And I think, you know, is there anything else you can do with it? And in that case, I think actually just creating quite a nice little portrait out of, out of your work colleague is not a bad way to, to capture it. Um, and it's something noticing this blot, blot on the wall, <laughs> which kind of grabs the attention a little bit. Um, you could even add a bit more texture into it if you wanted. Anyway, I hope that gives you a couple of ideas there, VG. Um, but thank you for sending that, that image in. Um, oh, Sandra's joined us, says, Hi, everyone, from a sunny but cold Birmingham. Birmingham. And uh, Robert's joined us uh, from Texas and says, How do you? Well, Robert, while you're watching, I don't think you've been checking your Facebook message, Messenger. If you could at some point, um, I'd like to kind of establish a line of communication with you. One of the things I'm aware of is that you two use the Canon R5. So there's sort of, sort of slight apologies to everybody else here for a slight bit of distraction. Um, <laughs> I'm quite wanting to have a chat with Robert about the, there's been a firmware update. And that all sounds a little bit technical, but basically what's happened is there's been um, an update to the, the camera, which is apparently supposed to allow my 45 megapixel camera to become a 400 megapixel camera. Unfortunately, it's not doing what I wanted it to. I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong with this. Robert's had this camera for longer than I do, same model. So I quite like to have a little chat about that if possible. Um, I, if you go to my YouTube channel, I even have uploaded, I think it's in the bite size playlist, but I just a couple of days ago, I actually uploaded a short video about the problems that I was having with this new firmware update, not delivering the 400 megapixels that I thought it was going to. Um, However, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a sort of side issue, um, but we can chat about that one later. Yeah, in fact, Robert says I will chat with you after the podcast. Okay, well, I'll have, we'll have a quick, quick chat about that at some point. Right, okay, apologies for the distraction there, but um, right, let's move on. So next up, we're going to talk about Eric. Now, Eric, um, now this is an interesting, this is where we're going to get slightly philosophical about the nature of photography. Eric has sent in this one. And Eric says, it's, this is called Out of the Past. It's converted to a drawing. So it's cropped and then a vignette was added, um, trying to make it appear as if it's exiting the photo with the front of the engine and the smoke outside the vignette, sorry, and the track outside the vignette and the smoke still inside. So kind of two different things going on here that Eric asking me about so he's taken a picture of a train he's used a, uh, an editing program to make it look more like a, a pencil drawing then he's also added a vignette to it so it's kind of looking like it's sort of kept in an oval shape except for the fact that what is the the oval would come round sort of down here but the front of the train and the track is just sort of sticking out of the oval as a you know to try and make it look like it's moving beyond the picture so these are these are the things that that um eric's talking about so that's the intent now the there's kind of well two different things here first the first of all is does the does the effect of coming out of the vignette work and in that situation i have to say i'm not totally convinced by it because first the because of the way that this is a soft black and white drawing effect, the vignette itself isn't solidly clear. You, we can kind of see it coming around here, but it's 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 not it's not like a hard line where you can see, and then you can see where it exits, where the front of the train exits. Um, it's, this is also very close up to the front edge of the picture. In a way, if you're trying to get something like this, you need more space. You need more space over to the right. Um, one of those things that if you have something which is directional in a photo, generally speaking, unless there's very good reasons for it, you want to have slightly more space in front of. So if you've got somebody walking, you've got somebody on a bicycle, you've got a train moving, you want to have slightly more space in front of it than you do behind it. So that visually the viewer gets the feeling that there's space for something to move into. 
Otherwise, you can kind of feel very pressed up against the edge. And this does feel very pressed up against the edge here. But I also don't think that the vignette is strong enough to really give you that sense of this exiting going beyond the vignette. The other thing about this, though, is the the real, I suppose, or the bit that gets me about this is the taking a photo and making it to look like a drawing. And have we sort of stopped it being photography at this point? Now, if this was a drawing, if you'd handed me a drawing, I might have gone, um, well, this is called understanding photography with Kim Ayers rather than understanding drawing with Kim Ayers. Some of the compositional rules apply, like I've just said, if you have more room in front than behind. But by and large, it's about photography. Now, it's a tricky thing because we do edits all the time. I tell you what, let me let me show you something else here. Let me take, supposing we take a photo like this. So, so this is St. Mary's Lighthouse um, over in Whitley Bay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this in Photoshop. So for those of you who are slightly less uh, familiar with the different kind of editing options available to people, we know that there's the kind of Instagram filters. You can just sort of click something and something instantly happens. But let's say we take this picture here and in Photoshop and most editing programs have variations on this. If I go to filter and I've got a filter gallery. Now, if I come to this filter gallery, now this has automatically gone to cut out. Um, I will just minimize this, or take this down to here. Let's try, I'm just trying to work out how to size this so that you can maximally see without my head blocking what's going on. So I've got a cutout option. I've got a colored pencil option. I've got neon glow. So as we can see, what's happening here, this one, rough pastels, sponge. That we can take, uh, we can apply a whole bunch of things. This one's called underpainting. And we can essentially change it. We're trying to change it from no longer looking specifically like a photo in order to make it look more like um, some kind of uh, piece of art. Accented edges, angled strokes, splatter. Let me just... Um, I'll just zoom in a little bit on this so you can see the effect a little bit more. We'll do that there. Um, splayed strokes. There's all sorts of things. We've got distortions, sketches. OK, so sketches here, bas relief, charcoal, uh, sort of chalk and charcoal, just charcoal on its own. Um, crayon, graphic pen. And you can start to see that some of these, you know, it's, it's not a, a million miles away then to go from a graphic pen or a pencil style um, reticulation. Can't say that one does much for me. Um, <laughs> but we can make something look like a painting or a watercolor or a piece of plaster. There's textured options here as well, where we can even make it patchwork, stained glass, mosaic tiles. You get the idea. And the question is, is, well, do we, re <laughs> there's a kind of what's the point or why would you want to do this? Now, I think sometimes in terms of graphic design, if you are designing a poster for something, if you are designing, then, you know, at that point, there are, there can be usefulness to it. Um, I, I've even used some effects as a particular picture I'm suddenly remembering where um, I kind of, as it sort of faded out at the edges of the photo, it sort of faded out into a sort of drawing style. And I was trying to use this to sort of emphasize almost a kind of Edwardian illustration style out of my photo. And so this then becomes a kind of an interesting idea. How much are we, I'm using these effects. I'm using these effects already. Where do you draw the line? At what point does something stop being a photo and just start being an effect where it's sort of pretending to be something else. So I have photos where, I mean, I've even done, um, I've done a podcast, or I've done a couple of podcasts on the notion of creating photos that look like 17th century Dutch art in their composition and lighting. And what I've talked about there is I'm emulating the compositional styles, the lighting, the texture, the, the mood of the way the Dutch artists painted 400 years ago, 350 years ago. 
And when I emulate those styles, those composition and lighting styles, the photo reminds you of a painting. The Edwardian illustration that I was talking about, the way I can mess around with colour can remind you of that. However, at all these points, the, the thing is, is that the photo, you know it's a photo. It's, a, it's an edited photo, it's a photo designed to spark your imagination, but I'm not trying to pretend it's anything other than a photo. It's a photo with additional elements in order to enhance the narrative I'm trying to give. And I think at the point where you step over that and you, you are no longer sure that it is a photo, and in the case of your train, what you've done is you've taken the train to make it look like a sketch. Why not sketch it? Maybe you don't like sketching. Maybe you like sketches. You like the composition of that. You would like to see it as a sketch. Instead of sketching the photo, you use the editing software to make it look like a pencil sketch. And that's OK if you want to do that and, you, and you know, you're happy with that and you want to print it out, put it on your wall, then that's fine. If you try to sell it as an original sketch by Eric, then I would have problems with that because I think there's nothing wrong with you using whatever tools you want to be creative. I just think you have to be kind of honest about it. Um, I have a problem at the moment. There's a lot of stuff going on with people seeing the AI art and the incredible things that can be done now whereby people can type in words and the program will create um, incredible uh, pieces of art with what look like pieces of artwork just from written uh, prompts. I think it's fascinating. I think there's a whole now new media of art, which is AI art. And I think as long as you are talking about the fact that it is AI art, then that's great. That's fine. I think it's perfectly legitimate. We can have a debate about that at another time if you want. But I think it's a legitimate form medium of art. What I feel is false is when people put something up and are kind of claiming it as an original photo, uh, original painting rather. Similarly with AI photography, there's all sorts of amazing photography which you think is photography but is actually just artificial computer creations. And if you are trying to pass off AI art, which all you've done is write in a few prompts as real photography, then I think that is straightforward deceit. There's no need for it. Celebrate the fact that you are using this new tool, this new medium to be creative. Just don't try and tell me it's something else which it isn't. Now, if you are doing AI photography, at that point, I find I can talk to you about compositional rules, what will work, but there's no point in discussing things like your aperture, your shutter speed, <laughs> um, ISO, all the things to do with the technical sides of the camera because you're not using a camera to create those images. So let's come back then to the idea of your picture of the train. Your picture of the train, you what you have done is you've converted it to make it look like a pencil drawing. So at this point, I can give you a couple of compositional techniques, but I can't really give you any photography feedback. I can't tell you, I can't see it as a photo in order to be able to say, actually, you might have improved on your photography if you had used this aperture, if you'd used this, if you'd made these color shifts in the white balance, or, you know, played with your texture or cropped it differently because I don't know what the original was like and what you... So it's a tricky one. I, I fully admit it's a, it's a tricky one to sort of fully navigate. Um, but I, I mean, it's an interesting area, but I think with this one, Eric, I think the, the real problem here is the fact that you've gone beyond the idea. You're not, it's not looking like a photo anymore and it doesn't look like um, it's pretending, you know, it's beyond the point of photography in order for me to be able to fully give you proper feedback in terms of understanding photography with Kim Ayers. Uh, so thank you for sending it in, though. Um, I think it's sort of it's really had to make me think about it because I really had to think about the fact that, well, hang on a sec, I'm using texture, sometimes adding ad adding new elements into a photo, removing elements. I'm not I've never called myself an in camera photographer where you go click and that's the end of it. I edit and that means removing, enhancing, all this. So at what point do you cross a line where you're saying, well, I'm using this editing technique, this one, this one, this one. And for me, it's at the point that you can't tell that it's a photo anymore. 
at the point that it sort of stops being where you're not trying to have it as a photo I think that's when we've kind of moved beyond the realms um, so thank you for sending it in it's really made me kind of have to sort of think about where the boundaries are which is always a really worthwhile exercise all right, I can see we've got a few more comments in. Um, where are we? Um, oh, April says, that's cool. Sandra says, oh, is this scanning an upgrade for the mirrorless as I have an EOS 5D Mark IV? And I'm wondering if that will work for my camera. Yeah, well, this particular firm where our update is for the mirrorless R5. Um, VG says, oh, yeah, thank you. Yes, I've got an idea. Um, April says, this relates to my past monochrome question. Um, it could be part of an art show theme. Um, uh, but April also thinks, uh, oh, she's saying AI takes all the fun out of photography. Boring. <laughs> it takes the fun out of art as well. But it's it, well, but then it's a diff just it's just a different form of creativity, I think. But where the problem comes is when you are pretending that it's something else. You play with AI photography all you like. Just don't pretend that you took the photo. Play with AI, AI art all, all you want, but don't pretend it's your brushstrokes. Um, that's really what I'm saying with that. Uh, oh, Pat says he has a winning smile, I mean. Um, right, okay, that's referring to VG's picture, I think. Okay, excellent. Um, oh, and Sandra says, thank you for the clarification on the camera. Cool, right, where are we then? So, let's move on to Robert. So, now Robert um, said, I took this photo, here we go, um, in 2021, while leaving New Orleans, I thought it would be an interesting composition, but I have a problem with the haziness. Making it black and white seems a little flat. As I'm still a novice on black and white, I thought I would get your take. Let me know what you think and how I should process the photo. If colour is a better option, I would be interested in your opinion. Well, OK, so absolutely, uh, I mean, if you're into your flight, uh, I mean, I love, I if I'm going on a plane, I have to get a window seat. I can just spend the entire flight, however long it is, pretty much just staring out the window. Just, you know, I, I love, absolutely love looking out the window. And, that, and this bit here where you're leaving or you're coming in and you're just getting below the cloud line and you've got all the horizon is just magical, absolutely magical to me. And there are a number of occasions I've tried sticking my camera out the window or not, well, I can't stick it out the window, obviously. <laughs> sticking it through you know pointing it through the window and trying and it but it's particularly difficult to try and get a really good shot the plane is also moving but um very quickly as by the time you've lined up and worked it out it's changed again you fire off a few shots but there is haziness problems quite often there is all sorts of angles there's lots of other things going on so i see what you're doing there's a potential the potential in here you know new orleans is over here there's a big river running up towards it which is giving us this s bend which should be leaving leading our eye towards it there's bridges there's boats there's cities there's you know there, there's all sorts of things in here but it is flat and we're not really getting that real sense of detail part of the problem is for you you're in the air you're moving you've got a mental 3d representational map you know what it is you're looking at to the rest of us looking at this photo, we don't really know specifically what we're looking at. If we take this idea of squint your eyes slightly or imagine this smaller, all we can really see is a big band of cloud and a wiggly river. And in fact, actually, unless we happen to really know that it is a river, we might even mistake it for a road. We're not totally sure. There's this pale patch running through the middle. Um, so what can we do about this? Now, the thing is, you've gone black and white with this. And one of the things we've talked about a few times here, Robert, is the fact that the other thing I'm aware of with this black and white is you're not using the full range of black and white. Um, I will just let's just open this in Photoshop. It's something I think what you need to do. Let me just close that over there. Whenever you're looking at a photo, go to your levels, just straightforwardly open up your levels and look at the histogram. And when we look at the histogram, what we notice is that there's a gap. You can take this slider and you can move it this way a little bit. You can brighten up. You can take this slider and you can take it down a bit. And that way you're using the full range of black to white. When you when you are you doing black and white, and let it kind of depends. 
but mostly, in most cases, you've already lost a load of information. You've lost the color information already. So you're trying to create, a, you know, you maybe need sometimes to kind of have more of a tonal contrast to make sense of it. However, having said that, I still think because it's a hazy photo to begin with, I don't think the black and white is doing it a huge amount of good. Now, Robert sent me the raw file, which is always a good idea if you can. Um, so let's just open this raw file and see what the original was like. So here we can see we've got a little tip of, tip of the edge of the wing here, um, obviously a bit more of an angle, so we can see that you straightened it when you were editing it. So what we'll do, just to get the raw file open, I will just take some of the highlights down to make sure that we're not losing all. We can come back to that and I'll bring some of the shadows up a little bit. Actually, it doesn't really need much of the way the shadows up. And then let's just, um, let's click open. And then let's make sure, let's, so what we'll do is we'll just straighten that horizon, um, take out that wing. In fact, really what we're doing, this we've got that corner of the bend, we've got this corner of the bend, and we'll just take that down, bring that up a little bit, and what we have is more or less your crop. Now we know we've got, we're working with this image. It is hazy, it is what can we do with it? And I think the black and white then, as you said, we, it's already, we're kind of struggling to find information. Turning it to black and white is uh, making it even more difficult to get the information. So I think the f first thing we would do, let's just take this into camera raw. And um, what I'd be tempted to do here is, uh, well, let's click auto, see what auto does. Always worth doing a little bit. Okay, so that's, um, create a little bit more contrast. Maybe we want to do a little bit more of that. Maybe, or let's see, let's take the, let's take the clarity. Okay, that, yeah, I quite like what the clarity is doing there. We might do, there's a little dehaze. That's, and we just push that that way a little bit. Do a bit more clarity. I quite like what the clarity is. The clarity is now really adding more texture into it. Maybe the dehaze is overdone. However, it has, has made everything very kind of bluish. I'm just gonna play with the, up that, a little bit, it's sort of bluey green, maybe touch the touch into the purple, touch into the yellow. We've got the clarity there. Take the dehaze, something like that, and click OK. And I think we've immediately got an image which is kind of grabbing us more. However, we still have a problem here that I think these clouds, the problem is, is that these clouds are really bright, really full of texture, grabbing all the attention. Now, when I look at this photo, there's an amazing, there's a boat down in the river here, a big ship. We've got all this bit. There's a quite an amazing looking bridge just here as well. And then in the distance, this is presumably the heart of the, 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 the kind of muddied part of the city where we've got all the skyscrapers and what have you. And then off into the distance looks like the bay or, you know, um, so it's quite a, there's a, there's a lot in there, but it's kind of too much to fit into certainly something on the screen. We're never really gonna get something on the screen here. And like I say, what's happening here is the clouds are detracting. The clouds are pulling all the attention. The temptation then is to maybe, if we were to bring this down to here, just have a hint of cloud, just so that we know that it's there. Maybe bring that up a bit. And then maybe we would just sort of, so it's not completely cinematic, bring that in, something like that. Now that I think becomes a start to become slightly more interesting, but we're still not really getting that sense of boat, bridge, city. We're following this line, but it's just a line on its own. I don't think, feel like there's enough in there. So another way of doing this is potentially, I think, the real fun part of the story here is where you come in here. We've got a combination going on. We've got the city bit over there, we've got this bridge here, and we've got this boat here. And these three are kind of almost lined up. And I think if we start to do something like this, just a little hint of the cloud, not too much, something like that, we may be starting to get something out of this picture which is showing us something. Now at this point, there feels like there's probably a bit too much gap between the bridge and here. There's a whole bunch of not a lot going on that we can really see. So what I gain, what I might be tempted to do, copy that, paste, um, bring that slightly higher up in the composition. Um, 
in which case we'd crop that out and then we would need to mask uh, that so we can just kind of blend that carefully back in there now obviously you would do it a bit a bit more um, a bit more carefully and then perhaps we kind of pull that in a little bit pull that in a little bit pull that down a bit something like that now at this point what we have is we have a picture which has this boat has the bridge has the city has we know we don't necessarily have to have the corners of the the river to know that it's zigzagging round so that's kind of giving us something there um, let's take that back into camera raw we might it, it, it's still feeling like it's difficult to make out the details perhaps if we boost the clarity even more it's a tricky one it's you know maybe get a little bit of lightness a little bit of texture yeah we're kind of losing some of the color again maybe i need to bring in a little bit more vibrance yeah even though i think that we've maybe improved the the composition slightly by doing this i still think that overall part of the problem is is that from a distance it's there isn't a kind of a clear feature there's not like a just a nice strong line and and what have you it's this this photo is really your story is all about the notion of this wonderful expanse of the fact that there are bridges and and skyscrapers and and ships on rivers and and everything else except trying to capture that all into one small photo is virtually impossible um and so all the detail gets lost and we've got to zoom right in before we can really see what's going on i think something like this creating a slightly layered effect probably works better than having it absolutely huge but if this was on an online competition uh, where people are just viewing this on a computer screen or even worse on a mobile phone or tablet then i just don't think there's going to be enough in here the lines are all very kind i mean there's a little bit of a diagonal here but we've got the horizontal line here the horizontal line of the bridge the horizontal line there the horizontal line there we still we don't have a line that's drawing us right through past the you know if there was a nice diagonal somehow that ran that took us from the boat to the bridge to the the city in the distance then i think we would have something but the river itself isn't strong enough to do that so ultimately then robert i think the i can absolutely see why you wanted to grab that photo i think the black and white was actually playing against you was taking you too far in the direction that that it's a the problem is you know the photo itself isn't strong enough it's fine it's an interesting one for your memory book i don't think it's the one that would ever kind of get there in the in the award winning kind of stuff by all means i know you fly quite a lot keep taking the photos but start trying to look for features landscape features like the river but that will lead you into the thing also be careful of the, the the clouds i mean when we go back to your original photo um let's just take this back to here um or the the, the first layer of crops and stuff like that the, the clouds themselves are so strong so bright that it tends to overpower everything else um so there, there's there's a tricky there's a you know there's a tricky balance to have. I'm not going to say it's easy to get a good photo out of a plain window. I don't think it is. But keep at it. Keep trying, um, and hopefully that that. But hopefully, what I've just kind of just talked you through there will give you a few little ideas to play with anyway. But thanks for sending that one in, Robert. Uh, right, where are we? Um, so. Uh, so, no, Meg says, I really like the wiggly lines of the road. And there you go. So first comment there was Meg assumed it was a road rather than a river, which is what it is, which kind of goes to show you the, the problematic nature of the, the detail of what the photo is actually about isn't necessarily coming across when Meg is looking at it um, through her um, on her tablet. Uh, VG says beautiful curves, the path of the river and the bridge is beautiful, the tsunami cloud could be a photograph in itself. Uh, Rosemary says agree VG those clouds are very dramatic. Uh, April says that's neat. Uh, Robert says I agree on the lost narrative, it's difficult to capture an entire city in one photo. Absolutely it is. Right, okay. 
Um, so where to now? Let's. Uh, right, so quick reminder as well that if you are finding these um, podcasts useful, interesting, entertaining, and you would like to support them in some way, then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayres is one of the ways you can do it. And also, if you would like to send your, your own images in at any time, then uh, we have a Facebook group called Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres. You can put your images in there or you can email me kim at kimayres.co.uk. So it's just kim at kimayres.co.uk. Send me your image. And if you want to send me a raw file, your original file, but it's too big to attach to an email, then you can use Dropbox, WeTransfer or Google Drive or something like that. Um, now, where are we? Uh, yeah, stick around the, the end of the, the next section. I'm going to talk about what we're going to be doing for the third anniversary of these podcasts. OK, right. So let's move on. Um, so the final one I'm going to talk about now before we get to what's happening next week is Andy. So Andy said critique, please. Um, and so now he the. Uh, he sent me a couple of versions of the same photo. So let's show you the color version first. So he says, this image was uh, the output from a club studio shoot with a ballet dancer model. So sometimes this happens, you know, camera clubs get together, they get a model, this, in this case dressed as a ballet dancer, and then club members get a chance to play with the lighting, instruct the model, and get a chance to sort of play around with studio lighting in a way that maybe they don't normally do. So I'm assuming it's one of those, Andy. Um, I was trying to do something a little different to the usual banner ballerina shots, and I liked the, snap, the shapes in this image, which reminded me of a still from a 1930s Follies film. Uh, the original colouring lacked a little punch, so I processed it as a sort of semi-cyanotype, uh, but also like the monochrome version. So this is the other one that he's done. This is, the, and I suppose this is more like the 1930s version he's talking about. Um, so he's then sort of done it as a black and white. He says, I can't really decide which one I prefer. So welcome your input. I've also had some negative feedback on the crop taking out some of the headband, but I think it creates a more dynamic image with a better engagement. So you can see that a bit of the headband here, notice it slightly more in this one here, has just been, has been cut off the top. And some people have criticised Andy for that. Um, again, he will welcome my comments on that. So I wasn't sure quite what he was dealing with on the original, so I asked Andy to send me um, the original uh, raw file, which he did. So this will kind of give us a sense of... Um... So you can see here that this is, this is the, the original photo. And at this point, um, what are you going to do? I'm just, uh, you know, we could maybe, you know, we'll just do a, a slight color shift. I mean, it's not going to be exact. Um, let's do an auto, something like that. This isn't exactly what he's got, but he's kind of taking us into the realms of, um, this is really sort of a slight bit of desaturation as well. It's not quite as strong as that. Um, maybe bringing the shadows up a little bit more. I am doing very, very quick thumbnail version of what Andy will have spent quite a bit of time over making sure he's getting exactly the kind of colour balance and light balance and everything else that he wants. So don't think for a moment that I'm <laughs> I'm doing well. Andy's done a much better better job. Zoom in on the details. Absolutely, he's got that. Um, and in fact, I think he's even kind of... Um, no, I'll come back to that bit. So let's just let's just open that like that. Now, <clears throat> if we take let's just, I'll just close Robert's pictures there, so it's not kind of getting in the way. As yeah, as you can see, a much better version of it. Um, it's gone for more gold. You know, there, there is more of a kind of yellow blue contrast, yellow cyan contrast, which I which I quite like on that. Although I think perhaps he's lost some of the, the, the reddish in the hair, which I think might be quite interesting in the colour version. Um, now, the thing is with this, if I, okay, let me just open this in Photoshop as well, so that I can, um, because it's, it's probably better, I should have been playing with this one in the first place. But, written no, ah yes, I remember why I brought this one in. It's, it's really what I wanted to talk about was the crop. You see, if you look at the original, he's got the top of the head, the the, the spikes in this headband are all showing. And then Andy 
taking the top off these and has been criticised about it. And I think really the, the criticism here is the fact that you've only taken a bit of the top off. I think it's, it's a little bit like, it feels like you, you, didn't quite, you didn't quite get it in. I think if you're going to crop, then you need to kind of crop properly. You kind of need to crop more than that. And in fact, actually, there's a slightly better way of doing that because there's something also about your crop ratio here. Now, you might have heard me talk before. Now, I, this is a tricky one because, Andy, if this is your favourite kind of crop ratio, then the fact that it's not my favourite kind of crop ratio, well, there's a matter of personal taste here. But I always tend to feel, for me, if you're going portrait, go portrait. If you're going landscape, go landscape. If you're going square, go square. Don't go nearly square. And if I look at the um, image size on here, your pixels are 1600 by 1695 and <laughs> in in this case and and it's just a bit that kind of makes me you know like you know like what I'm like with getting a straight horizon um what I find myself wanting to do is just take this and take that down to 1600 to match it now at this point We've maybe, I'll tell you what, what I'm going to do, because I still don't feel I quite got it here. I mean, this is why I kind of opened in here. Don't worry too much. Your, your editing is much clearer, clearer cleaner than, than this. But what I want to do is I'm going to take this down to, I've got, this is 4,000 wide. So I'm going to take it down to uh, 4,600, to within three pixels. That's my square bit. Where am I going to arrange this? Now, you've got yours little bit of space just above the elbow you're cropping here now because of the way you've got it cut you'll just see clipping the tip of those those spikes off I tend to feel if you come to something like that if you're going to clip the tips off clip them off make sure that it's clearly it's not it's not meant it does so that it doesn't feel like you just were being careless about it you make a kind of deliberate statement and then nobody can go oh you just missed a bit because you've clipped in clearly enough to make sure um, you know, and in fact, you know, maybe even just bring that in a little bit like that. And then that way you've got the square. Now, the next problem is that we have here, I think with the composition, is it feels like she's moving, she's leaning a little bit too far over to the left for the composition here. Given the fact that she's facing left as we looking, there's a lot of space on the right hand side. And if this was square, I'd want to kind of nudge her this way a little bit. So that, just like we were talking about the train earlier, that is a little bit more space in front of her than there is behind her. So if I do content aware here, then that creates a little bit more space um, to this side. And that feels like a slightly better balanced version. And within that, then maybe we can start cropping and, um, and what have you. Now, another thought with it. So I think if you're going for a square, this is kind of where I would go. This is the direct, I'll make sure it's square. If you're cropping off those, those, those bits of the headband, make sure you've cropped them off. We've got enough spikes coming out the side to know that the rest of the spikes will be going up, but it's cropped down enough to know that it's been definitely de deliberately cropped rather than accidentally cropped. Um, other options here is to actually go landscape with it. You know, if you were to sort of, stretch maybe even bring that down a little bit more we could kind of crop quite close to the tip of the head here again we don't want it you know and, and maybe even just just enough um space under the elbow something like that um and then again content aware that might fill in the that kind of i think also becomes slightly interesting as well where you kind of have a bit more space now it can be ending up kind of too much space on the left or you know if this was a poster great you leave lines for the writing maybe at this point you can start adding in a bit more texture or you could you know um if we something like this we go kind of um, add a vignette or something what would that do yeah that kind of sort of brings it back in it gives a sort of sense of her in more space but the vignette is also meaning that the space isn't dominating quite so much um, but then there's the idea of going black and white, which is what you did as well. And if we kind of, if I go to gradient map here, oh, let's reverse that. So, <laughs> um, 
that's perceptual will go to classic so it's it, so you know we're getting bits in here you then kind of maybe need a bit more brightness contrast take the brightness down play with the contrast up something like that i don't know there's as you know i mean there's there's plenty of ways to play around maybe we're kind of losing a bit too much shadow in her face there but converting to black and white is a very different thing your conversion to black and white you've gone for a completely black background you've just darkened that one down completely as well which is you know another way of doing it and i think for this photo works again if we open this if we're talking about my version of the crop i would take that down to 1600 to just kind of match the thing i would have that moved over a little bit if you were wanting square essentially i tend to feel that's a better balance of it um so i kind of hope that gives gives you some thoughts i i, I mean i must admit i do like this black and white version um uh, your your, your uh, where are we? yeah your color version um i think is an interesting one too the black and white one works i think in some ways i think you may be right maybe the black and white one does feel much more evocative of those kind of 1930s movies um but like i say it's a case of just making sure i would say you kind of just clip off maybe just enough of the hairband or whatever to make it feel like it was deliberately done um again maybe you can come in a little bit closer something like that and i think that 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 kind of thing allows you to kind of have the feel of it without it being um feeling like you you missed a trick or or you were just being careless and i know you weren't being careless but i think that's the way it's being interpreted so those who have been criticizing you about it is that feeling of crop it properly or or leave the space around it um so I hope that gives you um, some ideas there, Andy. Thank you very much for sending that in. It's a lovely photo. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's kind of fun, fun to play around with something like that. Um, OK, so a couple of bits and pieces in here. Um, right, so Robert, well, where are we? Um, uh, OK, so. Megs uh, Megs uh, oh, sorry April says very pretty Sandra says I love this photo Meg says great photo Sandra says I prefer the color version VG says wow Sandra says I, I prefer the original version oh is that the original be up before you get to the color okay right uh, Robert says I like the uh, composition and the narrative April says what is crop ratio and crop ratio is the notion of how wide it is to how tall it is all the other way around so a square you know if it's 1600 across it needs to be 1600 high sometimes you get a crop ratio a typical landscape crop ratio for example is two to one so that means if it's a thousand pixels high it would be two thousand pixels across portrait it would be kind of the other way around but there's variations there's subtle differences between that cinematic ratio you can have even 2.5 or something like that to one across um there's so there's different you know if you think of a 10 by 8 or 4 by 5 or a 6 by 4 as typical kind of photo arrangements so your crop ratio then is that notion of um what the ratio is between the length and the height but if it's exactly the same then then it's square um and what i say tend to feel is that if you're going square go square don't go just a little bit off square i think it tends to just kind of feel like it, the same way that i've talked before about tilting horizons tilt the horizon like more than 15 to 20 degrees or keep it straight when you've just got it tilted two degrees it just looks like it's not been edited right rather than you've made some kind of artistic statement out of it uh right what else have we got um rosemary says cropping the skirt and the headpiece so they mimic the same shape gives a pleasing balance um pat says i love the halo and circular tutu oh and also her expression maggie says this is uh, there's such a different feeling to the image when the dancer's knees are cropped out somehow less photographer dominant i uh, hope that makes sense just an interesting di in different view differing viewpoints i think that's a really good point in fact actually let's just do this because i think there's a there's a really strong point here when we're looking at this this is dancer dominant uh, sorry this 
when we're looking, what we what we feel is we're looking down on the the dancer, and the but the dancer has control of the situation. She's looking perfectly, uh, you know, she's looking up into the the camera. She's owning this space. The dress is coming round. As far as we're aware, she's standing on her feet, and we're standing on a ladder. Now, if we go back to the original um, crop like this, what we notice is she's kneeling down. And when she's kneeling down, I think it's a slightly more uncomfortable crop. I think it feels that it does feel photographer dominant. It feels viewer dominant. It feels like, you know, here we are. We are in a position whereby we're looking down and there, there is a different mood and feel to it. It doesn't feel like she's in as much control. It feels like the photographer is in control. Hmm. Difficult one. I, I probably want to play with my language a little bit more, or work out exactly what I wanted to say uh, rather than talking off the top of my head with this one. But do you understand? I'm wondering if you understand what I mean by this. I know Maggie understands it because this is her suggestion and I get it. I get what she's saying. There's a difference in mood. There's a difference in feel. There's a difference in power balance. I think that's maybe the, the, the feel of the word, the power balance. With this one, this feels like photographer dominant in the power. Whereas when you've got the crop, which is uh, where well, you don't see the knees, she looks perfectly fine like she still has the power um, is not being dominated in in this photo so yeah really interesting point that maggie uh thank you for raising that one um where else have we got okay so april says both color and black and white are really pretty rosemary says having the legs out of you also makes it feel like someone walking on a catwalk catwalk where the curtains hang uh meg says i completely agree with you there mum and um photo uh robert says the black and white also has a great aesthetic um, oh, April says, no, what was his crop ratio? His crop ratio was essentially 16 to 17, which just isn't quite as much as, so it was 1600 to 1695. So a crop ratio of 16 to 17 isn't enough of a difference. You know, 16 to 32 or 16 to 24 or something like that, I think would have made a sort of a, a better kind of feel. Or you go 16 to 16. Um, or in this case, 1600 to 1600. I hope that makes sense. Uh, right. OK, so thank you very much for sending that one in, Andy. And uh, thank you, Maggie, for that, that really interesting observation as well. OK, so thank you to Andy. Thank you to VG. Thank you to Robert. And thank you to Eric for sending your images in. I think it's been a really quite interesting kind of, what was that, lots of philosophical ideas coming out with this as well as um, editing ideas. Now, next week, next week on the 9th of April is, as well as it being Easter Sunday, happens to be the third anniversary of these podcasts. Episode 148. Um, obviously, I've not been doing full on 52 a year. There's been a couple that I got missed out. Um, but episode 148 will be the third anniversary. I've been trying to think a little bit about what I might do to make it to mark the occasion. And there, so what I've decided is that kind of two two strings to this. First of all, you, you, the viewer, you, the, the, the people, those of you who've been following these podcasts for any length of time, send me your stories, email them to me, put them in the Facebook group, whatever you want. But I want to hear how you you feel that like your your photography has developed and grown. I want to hear your story. I want I want to, this is a celebration. I'd like to make it a celebration of what you've achieved. OK, so if you feel that like you have particular photos or particular understandings or any way you want to interpret this is how how have you been feeling the benefits of not just what I'm telling you, but being part of this community, part of this group, um, you know, I think sometimes that, you know, the support we have from each other is just as important as anything I happen to be saying on the screen for, you know, during these weekly podcasts. So I really want to know your your points of celebration. Being part of this group, how has it helped you develop? Has it helped with your um, with your confidence, with your understanding, with outcomes you know have you sort of won a few awards or or moved up the rankings or anything like that something where you feel that so this is so tell us your good your, your kind of good stories 
So send those in to me. And then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to have a little bit of fun this week. I'm going to go back through the past year. I'm going to go and look at all the folders of some of the entries that have been sent, whether it was through the um, some of those that were sent in for critique, but also probably more of those that were sent in for some of the challenges that we've done across the year. And I'm going to pick out some of the best photos, which I feel, wow, these are great photos. Um, and let's award a few smug points for those as well. So that's the next week. So I hope you'll come along and let's let's kind of celebrate you next week. Uh, so that's the 9th of April. Uh, we will be a celebration of the three years of podcast, um, the Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers. So send me your stories and um, or even if, if, if part of that story is you've got a really great piece of news with a photo that you've done where you feel that, you know, um, you've, you've gained the benefit and it's helped you uh, tell us a story about that as well. So that will, you know, that that I think is what we'll do next week. Um, so thank you to everybody who has uh, contributed um, and uh, look forward to seeing you all next week. Uh, right now, let me see if I can just, <laughs> well, I struggle to find out which screen I'm supposed to put up next. Um, yeah, see you all next week. Send me your stories and I'll have a fun look through the photos. Cheerio.